Okay. The expatriate's guide to handling money is handling money and taxes is a very important discussion that deals that focuses on Americans who are living outside the United States. In fact, the book was written for the four to eight million Americans who live outside the United States, not all of them who live in Israel yet. <clears throat> anyway, Ron was talking before, and I remind you of the story, so Ron, I will share the story with you that, uh, that came to mind, which was about a little boy who comes home from Hebrew school. And his mother says to him, she says, Johnny, what did you learn in Hebrew school? And he thinks for a minute, and he says, Ma, well, it's like this, you see, Moses was in charge of taking the Jews out of Egypt, because things weren't going so well for them there. So he gathered them all together, and they ran to the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were busy chasing behind them. And so Moses got on his walkie-talkie, and he called headquarters, and he says, listen, I have a problem. I need, uh, I need the Army Corps of Engineers to come here, because we got to cross the Red Sea. And within an hour, there was trucks coming with a pontoon bridge that they set up over the Red Sea, and all the Jews ran over the pontoon bridge and got to Israel, and just as they got to the other side, the Egyptians started crossing over this bridge, and Moses picked up the walkie-talkie and he called the Air Force, he said, we have a problem, the Egyptians are crossing over the bridge too. Within four minutes, there were eight F-16s that came screaming in and they blew up the bridge, and all the Egyptians sank to the bottom of the Red Sea. And Johnny's mother was shot. And she says, Johnny, is that really what your teacher taught you in Hebrew school? And he said, well, well no, Ma. But if I told you what the teacher really said, you'd never believe it. <laughs> so that's how a lot of people feel about the whole back uh, F-bar, Israel reporting kind, kind of thing. I've had many clients walk into my office who tell me, I don't understand. I've, I've owned the same offshore mutual fund for 20 years. It's never been a problem. Why will it be a problem now? And the answer is because things have changed and there's a new reality that we have to deal with. So today I'm going to talk to you about a, a couple of sections from the book. I'll give it kind of a, give you a taste about it and then maybe it'll excite you to get the book at the end. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is why someone would have a U.S. brokerage account and what problems will that solve for, for any investor. The second thing we're going to talk about are mutual funds, because I think a lot of people invest in mutual funds, and how to deal with it when you live overseas, and I'm going to focus on some of the mistakes that people make. And the third thing that I want to touch on then is simple bank deposits. And then we'll talk about a few other things that show up in the book that, uh, that you can learn about in a minute. Okay, so the first topic is, why is it that people have U.S. brokerage accounts when they live overseas? It would make sense that if you are actually dedicated to living in Israel, that you would simply move your assets to Israel. So I would like to argue that there's a definition of diversification. Did anyone's grandmother ever tell them something like, don't put all your eggs in one basket? Yeah. So that, that's, I say that in lots and lots of different ways, but I say that all the time. But in terms of a, a US brokerage account, one of the things that a lot of people like is that it has so many different possibilities for what you can buy, not the least of which is stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. But you can have managed money accounts, and you can have REITs and real estate, and uh, bank CDs you can buy. All sorts of different possibilities are available to you inside that brokerage account. Why is that important? Because if you're an American, and all of a sudden you are used to these kind of services, and you all of a sudden transfer your assets to your local Israeli bank, you might find it it's not available to you anymore. And those specific assets which are available to you in Israel might create a problem. And the problem we'll talk about in a minute is going to be mutual funds. The other reason that people like to have US brokerage accounts is they like to have the services that are available. They're used to having their statements in English. Who here is absolutely 100% fluent in Hebrew, reading and writing? I love speaking at the AACI, because we're all like, all really pretty close to getting good at Hebrew. So that, that's a, it's a benefit. It's nice to get your credit cards and your debit cards, things that you're used to, everything coming to you in English. You can write checks, you can buy your stuff online, right, and, and pay with it with your US debit card. Now, the topic that we're going to talk about today is not only that you get a 1099 at the end of the year, which makes filing your taxes much easier, 
but you also get, well, let's say like this. If you have a U.S. brokerage account and you have some stocks and bonds and mutual funds in it, which of those assets do you have to report on your FBAR, your report of foreign, uh, your foreign, your report of foreign accounts? Yes. Municipal bonds. Municipal bonds on your FBAR. What else do you have to report on your FBAR? Run the accountant. Nothing. You don't have to report any assets that you hold in the United States on your FBAR. The FBAR is this really, really difficult form that's creating a lot of problems for people. What it says is, basically, and I'm not an accountant, so you can ask Ron more about this, but if you have assets that are held in any account outside the United States, more than $10,000 at any point during the year, you've got to tell the IRS. <coughs> you might not even owe taxes on it. But if you just have the account, you have to report that to the IRS. And if you don't, you might come crying to my office, like the client who came in on Thursday and said, Doug, you know, I didn't realize that all of these different accounts I had in Israel and overseas, I had to report. I didn't even owe tax. I didn't make money. But now he owes $200,000 to the IRS that he wouldn't have owed had he just filed the FBAR properly. So the answer is, when you have your accounts in the U.S. brokerage account, it's just a little bit easier. Okay. Let's talk about mutual funds. A mutual fund is simply a basket. Everyone puts his money in. There are managers who trade inside the basket. They might buy stocks, they might buy bonds, with all sorts of different investments that people have. It's a, it's a very, very common investment that, that, uh, that people like. What are some of the main benefits? You have diversification. Inside the fund, let's say that you want to invest $100,000. How many stocks can you buy or how many bonds can you buy? But if you take that same $100,000 and put it into a couple of mutual funds, well, you're going along with ten, hundreds or thousands of other people, and that fund itself might have millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, and the managers are managing it, and they might have hundreds of different investments, and you own a piece of the pie, so you're very, very diversified. You also benefit from the economies of scale because if you go out and buy a bond, you put 10, 20, 30, 50 thousand dollars into a bond. When a fund manager who manages bonds buys a bond, they might buy a million or five million. They're buying wholesale, we're buying retail. So the prices that the managers might get are better. It's very liquid, you can buy and sell the funds all the time. It's convenient, you don't have to deal with making day to day decisions. And finally, you get the professional manager. Those are a lot of the benefits of mutual funds. By the way, I'm just talking very generally, not a recommendation for anyone in particular. If you need any specific investment advice, you should be sure to speak to a licensed investment advisor. By the way, just for the record, that guy who had to, who owes $200,000 who I mentioned before, had gotten plenty of advice to buy offshore mutual funds from non-licensed -lic investment advisors, which is what put him in this position in the first place. There are disadvantages. There's no perfect investment. I don't even know a perfect investment. When you own mutual funds, sometimes they're so diversified. I've met clients that they own 10, 20, 30, 40 different funds. They're, they're so diversified that they, they don't really have any chance to, to outperform or to benefit from, from moves in the market. As Because it's an investment that has risk, your returns will fluctuate. So if you're not the type of person who can stand the potential for loss, mutual funds aren't for you. A lot of times mutual funds are nervous that people are going to cash out the fund. So the fund itself has to raise cash. So they might be sitting on 10, 20, 30 percent of the portfolio in cash, which means that 10, 20, 30 percent of your money is in cash. Now maybe that doesn't fit with what you wanted to do. So I'm not saying it's a good or bad decision, but it, it might not be what you were looking to do. And naturally, the big issue that people talk about with mutual funds, as with any investment is that there are costs involved. And finally, who knows? The managers may not beat the market. They're, they're, they're good and they're talented and they've gone to school and they're professionals, but that's not a guarantee that they'll do any better than throwing darts at the stock charts, right? Okay, so now we have a real problem. Because we've spoken about mutual funds. Let's say you like mutual funds and it's something you wanted to buy. So you, you, as Americans living outside of the United States, are stuck in a catch-22. Catch-22 is like this. After 9-11, there were a number of laws passed. The most famous one that the United States passed was a rule called the Patriot Act. The, purpose, the, the, the main purpose of the Patriot Act was to stop terrorists from 
moving money, because they figured if they could stop the motion of money from one place to the other, the terrorist source would dry up. So it turns out that didn't really work so well, but the law stayed in place. And now, the mutual fund lawyers have interpreted this law in a very interesting way. They're not the only ones. There are a lot of the brokerage firms, a lot of the banks have felt that anyone living outside the United States cannot have a U.S. brokerage account or cannot own a U.S. mutual fund. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but it happens many times that Americans try to buy a good old-fashioned mutual fund that they would have bought when they lived in New York, and all of a sudden, the, the fund says, I'm sorry, your trade is rejected. Address overseas. Or they'll say, the client needs to sign a W-8, meaning that he's a non-U.S. entity. But you can't sign that because you are a U.S. entity. So you're not allowed to sign that, so you can't end up buying the U.S. mutual fund. So what do a lot of people do? Well, you're living in Israel, you go to your bank, and you buy a mutual fund at your local bank. Or you go to a, one of the offshore mutual fund vendors, and some of them today will still sell Americans offshore mutual funds, even though I don't really think they should do that. <coughs> then you're stuck with what's called an offshore mutual fund, which simply means a mutual fund is not registered in the United States. So some people think, wow, it's got like, this mystique. It's offshore, it must be better. They're not better. There's no difference. The managers of the offshore funds are investing in the same markets that the managers of the onshore funds are investing on. Frankly, their performances are often worse. Their costs are higher. Nothing special. They don't have access to any secret investments. And if you own an offshore mutual fund, the United States does not consider that the same as if you own an onshore mutual fund. They consider it something called a PFIC, P-F-I-C which stands for a Passive Foreign Investment Corporation. I'm not even going to go into the whole detail, but it just sounds scary. It's not the type of thing that normal people like you and me want to own and now have to report that to the IRS. And you can ask your accountant, do you like filling out tax returns for people who own PFIX? Is it his? No, he's shaking his head. It's not the normal thing that normal Americans do. So if you try to buy one of these funds, some people think it's illegal. A lot of mutual funds that are offshore won't even sell to Americans. But if you can find a way to do one, and by the way, that includes going into your local Israeli bank and say buying a local mutual fund. From the American standpoint, that's a PFIC. That's a foreign mutual fund. It's an offshore mutual fund. And it creates a lot more reporting requirements that are very, very unpleasant to say the least. And if you do it wrong, then I think the IRS put, really will red flag you and will go after you in an audit. So what's the solution? The solution for someone who's looking for diversification, who's looking, right, because I think that's a, let's, this is not an investment lecture, right? Normally, my day job is that I'm an investment advisor. I help people with financial planning, and I set up their investments for them. But I'm not, I'm not, uh, that's not today's discussion. However, suffice it to say that I'm a big fan of diversifying. And if you can't buy a U.S. mutual fund and you can't buy an offshore mutual fund, you might want to consider buying what's called an ETF. Anyone know what that stands for? Exchange Traded Fund. Exchange Traded Fund. Works very much like a mutual fund, except instead of, it trades differently. It trades like a stock on a stock exchange. It's very liquid. You can buy and sell it all day. They're usually very diversified. A lot of times, they're designed simply to mirror the return of an index as closely as possible. So. You might buy an S&P 500 or a Dow Jones. Again, I'm not recommending any of these per se, but these are some of the most popular ones. And now you have automatically diversified yourself to some extent. And if you buy a few of these funds, you diversify yourself even more. Some of them are actively managed. Some of them are passively managed. And they don't get, I can't tell you what it'll be tomorrow, but today the ETF marketplace does not distinguish based on what address the client comes from. So I've never had an ETF say, oh, wait, like the client's in Israel, you have to bust the trade. That's never happened. And we've bought millions and millions and millions of dollars of ETFs for clients. And the, the final part of the solution is what do you do if you don't know which ones to buy? So A, you can ask me. But really, I prefer to tell people that it's better to diversify more broadly and to get some level of professional management. So you can work with what are called institutional money managers. These are the managers that normally deal with <coughs> institutions, hence the name, institutional money managers. Their clients will have mil a million or five million or ten million dollar minimum. But when you go through an investment advisor, you can normally get in with these same managers for lower minimum 
depending on the manager, it'll be $50,000 or $100,000, something of that, uh, of that level. OK, so we've spoken about some of the, the, the risks and the benefits of having US brokerage accounts and mutual funds. And you have to be careful, of course, about determining these risks and where you get your advice from. That's what I was mentioning earlier. You know, for those of you who don't know, I'm from New York. And in New York, and upstate New York, anyone else from New York? OK, so those of you who know, there are a lot of uh, um, Indian tribes in upstate New York. And I heard that one of them had a new Indian chief. The old guy died, and the new one came in. But the new fellow was kind of modern, and he didn't know all of the, the old ways. And it came time, it was getting near winter, and all of the Indians came to the new chief, and they said, well, chief, tell us, is it going to be a cold winter? Of course, he had no idea, you know? So he says, one minute. He runs to his office in the back, and he calls the weather station. He says, uh, is it going to be a cold winter? And the weather station says, yeah, yeah, it'll be cold. So he runs to, back to the office, and he says, yes, it will be a cold winter. So the next day, all the Indians go out, and they're gathering wood to prepare. And they're working very hard, and they're a little bit unhappy about all this hard work. So they come back to the new chief, and they say, chief, are you, are you really sure it's going to be a cold winter? He said, uh, hold on. He runs back to his office and he calls the weather station. He says, are you positive it'll be a cold winter? And he said, yeah, positive. He goes back, he says, for sure it'll be a cold winter. And the next day, the, all the Indians go out gathering wood. Again, they're a little bit upset because they're really working hard. And they come back to the chief. They say, are you absolutely, positively, 100% sure it'll be a cold winter? And now he feels terrible because all of the guys are out collecting wood. He says, one minute runs to the back and calls the weather station and goes, are you 100% absolutely positively sure it'll be a cold winter? And the weather guy says, yeah, he says, I'm 100% I'm sure. So the Indian chief says, well, how can you be so sure? The weatherman says to him, well, I'll tell you. He says, every morning I drive to work and I see all the Indians are out there gathering wood. I know when they're gathering, it's going to be a cold winter. So I was like thinking about this when I think about where people are getting advice from. Make sure you're getting good, qualified advice from qualified professionals who deal in this, not from your friends who tell you, oh, I just bought this great fund, or you don't really have to file that return. No one's going to find out. Get good information. And finally, for those of you who think safety is important, as I am a big fan of safety, you may have had trouble with banks in America that also are not either allowing new deposits, they're not opening accounts for people overseas. The solution goes back to the first thing I spoke about, which is you can open a US brokerage account, and in that account, you can buy FDIC-insured bank deposits, just like you would go into a bank. They're called brokered CDs, because there's a broker who's going to buy it for you instead of buying it directly at the bank. There are a few benefits, which is that um, that even though you suffer from the same problems, the problem being that the banks won't open an account for you if you have a foreign address, and interest rates are low. Right? Anyone notice that bank deposits pay pretty low these days? Mm -hmm. I can't help you with that. <laughs> and you have a $250,000 limit for how much insurance you get by the FDIC. So if you're dealing with any of these issues, by buying the CDs through a brokerage firm, you can, first of all, get, you can, brokerage, there are many, though not all, brokerage companies that will open accounts for people living outside the United States. If you have any questions about it, ask me, because this is what we do all the time. But there are others as well. Um, through those brokerage accounts, you can buy your CDs. If you have more than $250,000, which you want to protect with the FDIC, you can just tell your brokers, say, listen, buy me four CDs of $250,000 apiece, and each one will be separately insured by the FDIC. And finally, one of the benefits when you buy you know, bigger numbers is if you ever need to sell off part of it, you don't have to break the whole CD. You can just, if you need $10,000, you sell that piece off. And don't do what a lot of other people's you know, friends recommend. Oh, well, just use your brother's address in, you know, in America because who will know? First of all, again, ask your accountant. If you have evidence of residency in the state, you might actually be subject to pay tax in that state. Last thing you want is more fight. Um, it's a lie, right? It's not true. It might annoy your brother. So often I've had people come in and say, oh yeah, I use my brother's address. 
And I know the brother, and separately says, you know, could you tell my brother to stop getting his mail sent to my house? It's not an ideal solution to lie about your address, but there are solutions for this in the end. Okay, so I'm just about out of time. I just want to let you know, for those of you who want to get a copy of the Expatriate's Guide to Handling Money and Taxes, which includes other information other than what I spoke about today, not the least of which is how to deal with transferring assets, how to deal with uh, insurance issues that a lot of Americans have overseas. If you want to get um, uh, credit cards or debit cards, right? They, there are solutions discussed in the book with that as well. And the biggest thing is if, as a result of this discussion, you are beginning to think that maybe you didn't quite disclose properly to the United States, you should actually speak to your accountant. There's also a chapter in the book written by Dave Wolf, who is a tax attorney, and he walks people through the process of what's, of the, what's called an amnesty process, which um, allows you to come clean to the IRS. You still pay the tax, and you still pay the fees, and there's all sorts of things you'll pay, not the least of which is the, the lawyer's cost as well, but at least you're not going to have to worry about someone coming, knocking at your door, which is surely what's going to happen as soon as Israel begins. You said in 2015, they're going to start reporting all the way back to 2013. So I think that uh, the best thing you'll also get from the book is a checklist that Ron has graciously put together that tells you what you need to be doing right now. And if you want to do this right now, be sure to um, download a copy of the book. The book is on sale for $8. We're giving it to people here until the end of the month. You can get it for free. You'll just go to this website that's on the bottom here. And in the back, we have little white pieces of paper with the cover of the book. Your yarn is waving them around now. And on the bottom of that is the website that you need to go to. So you can just take one. There's enough for everyone. And you can go to that website, download the book for free until the end of the month. I suggest reading it. And don't wait for the end of the month, however, to file your FBAR because it's due with the IRS at the end of the month. Okay, thank you very much.